Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to our Monday session of Rotary Kilkenny. I'm delighted to welcome Ray O'Brien, who is Senior Cybersecurity Analyst with the ESB. And he's going to talk about what is perhaps the hottest topic of the moment, which is cybersecurity. The sudden and almost overwhelming focus on cybercrime has meant that every unexpected phone call, every unexpected text or WhatsApp message or email or Facebook friend request now comes with a side order of suspicion and even fear and obviously the HSE breach has even further heightened that and the grim reality is that all that suspicion and fear is going to be with us for the long haul and with so much personal information compromised in the ransomware attack from the wizard spider criminal gang the fear is that every unsolicited contact or request for information spam or phishing attacks is going to be with us for months if not years and to help us answer some of the queries ray is going to talk about cybersecurity in general and what we can do to enhance our own cybersecurity Ray, you're very welcome today. Thank you. Uh, Ray, I've known for over 20 years, uh, man and boy, uh, when uh, his father uh, was involved in, uh, I would say, and being evangelical about the Apple Mac computers. And I purchased my first one in 1998 uh, from uh, Ray's father. Um, but Ray, you, you're from Kilkenny uh, mm -hmm. and you worked with your father in uh, O'Brien uh, Computer. What was the title of the firm? O'Brien Associates. O'Brien Associates. O'Brien Associates. Associates. And uh, uh, you moved away then from working in the family business. And mm -hmm. what career trajectory did you take after that? Semi move away. I still like to, to dabble a little bit when I needed to help out, but I, I, I work more more centrally in cybersecurity for operators of essential services so I, I work at the moment with the esb which would be everybody knows the national provider of electricity and and generation as well in ireland um but for many many years i suppose i started I suppose my, my father uh, as a young boy cleaning computers and wiping them then after he fixed them and learned the, the trade of networking and, and software and all of these things over those 20 years, I'm imagining. Um, and now I, I work primarily in just cybersecurity itself, so information security. And working with the ESB, it's possibly one of the most critical uh, services in the country. If a breach occurred there, we're all in trouble. A breach occurred with the HSE in the last couple of weeks, and it, I suppose, highlighted how vulnerable individual computers are and that each individual is responsible it's not just the organization itself but the individuals working for such organizations how can we be alert to what was in many ways a theoretical uh, uh, war but now it's become a hot war uh, how can we be alert to what vulnerabilities there are in the systems that we're used to using every day well, this is one of the things. I mean, it's it's been around for quite a while. I'm looking at it on a daily basis, um, and one of the, the things I do find striking is you now that it's on our doorstep, we're we're starting to, I suppose, to listen a little bit more. Um, every system has weaknesses, so you, there, there's this um, well-known fact in cybersecurity that you can never be totally secure. Uh, an awful lot of it may plays on our risk appetites. So what we're willing to accept and what we're not. I'm sure we're all business people here now, so we know we can accept a little bit of risk in order to push forward. But in, in a lot of cases, we might not want to. Um, for example, I mean, if we look at the, the, the HSE and what we speculatively know about you know, what happened, I think one of the, um, one of the, the speculations, which I think is probably becoming more and more true and is, is 99% uh, the first entry for an awful lot of these uh, attacks is uh, people's access to email and, and the, the lack of security awareness when handling those things. So, you know, the speculation is that an email was received and a link was clicked on um, and moved, went to a well-known um, document sharing platform like Google Drive or Office 365 or something. And that was a piece of malware came in, you know, and it's very hard to stop those things. 
very hard. The, the, one, the one thing I try to tell people is um, lessons from when we were kids and, and try not to talk to strangers. It's one of the, the best lessons that you can have. Yes, um, but when you're working with a large organization, particularly a state service, mm -hmm. uh, there are so many strangers, the, even mem ordinary members of the public who get in touch mm -hmm. are strangers. So, and they need to get in touch. But uh, how can uh, the person at the end of the computer, whose primary job is providing a service and isn't necessarily always going to be cybersecurity aware, mm. uh, what are the red flags that should really jump out that might be maybe pink flags, but are seriously could be seriously problematic? Well, I don't know if anyone has ever seen a phishing email. I'm sure, I'm sure we have and might not know about it. But uh, commonly, there's bad, there's little traits that you can see. It'd be an address that you probably have never noticed before. Um, most people would know of their customers. But like you said, in, in larger organizations, it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, but, the, but there's there's little tell traits. You know, if there's a an aggressive tone in an email, it makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, always err on the side of caution. Um, like there are systems in where I work in lots of places to reduce the possibility of, of these things coming in, but something will always slip through. Um, but we, it's all good. we tend to rely on people's um, sense of confidence with what they're handling. So I mean, if there's any sense of that, oh, I wasn't expecting this, uh, this email with this attachment or this invoice today, then maybe take a little bit of caution with it. Um, you can always go back. I, I tell people to, to, to ring the center and check first, you know, were you supposed to send me this today? Generally, probably yes or, or no, then you can go, okay, please check it away. Mm -hmm. But it's simple things like that that can help an awful lot. But the hardened criminal can disguise an email address mm -hmm. and make it look plausible. Um, and particularly now that there's been this huge data dump or potentially this huge data dump. So email addresses uh, will now be available to uh, people like the Wizard Spider gang, and they can use those as plausible uh, ways of getting in touch. Mm -hmm. um, what can the ordinary person do uh, if you're waiting for an email from Joe Bloggs and you get an email that looks like it comes from Joe Bloggs? Um, is, there, is there anything that we should be aware that we should be doing? Well, I mean, like, like I said, when it comes to the email itself, it comes down to your confidence. Um, like I, I saw one months ago, uh, people that I know that they, they received an email, again, like that, it was a, an aggressive tone, just, you know, I need you to pay this yes. invoice now. And um, it was out of the blue, but everything looked to be right. It was signed, you could go through the email thread, you could see everybody had signed off on it the whole lot. But the one thing that twigged with the person that wasn't right was because she was addressed by her full name and not her nickname. You know, simple little things. It's like, well, you know, why didn't this person call me Ray? Where it's Raymond O'Brien or dear Raymond O'Brien. You know, there's a little formality changes that you can pick up from. Yes. They are very good. And it, 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 is, it is very difficult in some cases. This is why you know, we have to also think a little bit outside the person as well and, and wrap these things in what we call controls. So, you know, making sure you have a good antivirus system hooked into your email, make sure you have your Windows machines or whatever machines up to date in case something does slip through. Um, and it's what we call layered defense. So, yeah. But one of the problems is that uh, a lot of the computers in, for example, in the HSE are mm -hmm. older computers that are not compatible with the most up-to-date virus software or their Microsoft has stopped supporting them. Windows 7 comes to mind. Um, and if someone still has a Windows 7 computer, is there anything they should be doing uh, to ensure a degree of security? Uh, interesting one. Um, I, I actually, I fixed a computer recently for somebody, um, they use it for their accounts package. Um, for doing their customer invoicing, purchase invoicing, and, all. and it was in a version of Sage. I don't know if anybody uses it from 15 years ago on a, an old Dell with Windows XP. Hasn't been supported for a lot longer than Windows 7. 
And in reality, there was no there was no reason to tell the person not to use it anymore. Uh, it wasn't it? connected, wasn't connected to the internet, doesn't use any USB keys. All it is is a computer plugged into a printer, and that was it. Right. It's only when you start connecting these devices that are old and vulnerable that you start to open yourself up. You increase um, the exposure to those weaknesses, as I recall it. But if you, but again, you know, this lady with her Windows XP machine who's worked for 20 years, why, why change it? Hmm. Um, Probably not the message I should be giving. But, you know. <laughs> not to somebody who wants to sell computers. But if, <laughs> at the same time, we, are li we now live in a connected world. And that person who has their accounts on that safe, locked away computer may need to get them to an outside body such as revenue or to uh, somebody if they're looking for a loan from the bank, for example. Mm. Um, is there any way that they can ensure that it's safe? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the, like... You, you again keep that machine isolated so one, one of the things that we talk about these ransomware attacks which is what happened in the hsc the the biggest problem with these malwares is that they want to spread you know they yes. want to go to other computers and 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 cause their little bit of damage where they where they can or you know scope around to get this information to keep these things safe you either keep these things isolated so one of the things you might have read in like Twitter reports or things that about the HSE attack is that the speculation is they closed the systems down to make sure it couldn't spread anymore. And where this lady with her, with her Windows XP machine, keeping it isolated means that her most valued piece of technology is safe. Yes. Now, if you want to move from that, you know, um, it will accept a USB key. So if you have a USB key, you know and trust and you use an antivirus on it, then I don't see much reason to right. put it in, take it off, check it with antivirus again, away you go. Mm. Mm -hmm. For uh, state bodies such as yourselves, um, cybersecurity is, it, it, it means constant vigilance, but it's not just you who has to be constant, constantly vigilant. You have to ensure that people for whom vigilance doesn't necessarily vigilance in this area doesn't come naturally do you are you involved in training or in ensuring that people are hyper aware of this major potential problem there, there are programs um and it, it's one uh, service providers all around ireland kilkenny as well there's lots of it providers but the, the biggest thing that's being pushed over the last number of years in terms of cyber security is training you know, uh, security awareness training to give you a background in what can be, what can happen, um, give you those principles that you should use and employ to reduce your risk. Um, you know, everybody talks about you know, have your backups and make sure you're antivirus and all of these bits and pieces. So there, there are trainings there, and then you can go more advanced. You know, like myself moving into the actual um, professional side of the training that that goes a little bit beyond what everybody should really know as a basic um, basic level of knowledge when it comes to handling a computer. Um, I think even the, the European computer driver's license now in, includes cybersecurity to some extent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, this was all theoretical up to so recently, but now it's, it's hit us all. Um, one of the things that has happened uh, rel relatively recently is people get telephone calls uh, from an unknown number, usually North Macedonia or Tunisia or somewhere utterly, you, you certainly wouldn't be normally getting a call from there, and it suddenly stops ringing. What's the purpose of such a call? If it rings once and then stops ringing, they obviously don't want to talk to you. Is it to get you to ring back at a, some high cost number? Can be. Um, a, a lot of times where you have just a single call or when someone hangs up after you answer, uh, they're checking to make sure your phone number is real. Um, it's quite similar to, I don't know if anyone has ever read up on credit card scams and things like that, but you know, when, when your credit card, if it does unfortunately get stolen, within minutes it's been tried in an ATM to make sure that it can work or it's been tried somewhere. It's the same for these phone numbers because uh, if you have a list of phone numbers that work, you can sell that to somebody else. 
Um, so, and, and this is, you hear about this a lot, that a lot of these cyber grant gangs and these organizations are, in fact, that they're organizations. They're, they're, they have marketing departments, they have sales departments, and they're trying to produce their service to get a product to sell it onto someone else. And, you know, in, in this case, the, the, the data dumps that go out onto the internet, they're being sold to somebody else in the chain to, to produce some other form of either product or service or, or scam, shall we say. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's only worthwhile committing a cyber crime if it generates an income. And mm. the danger is that if a country, well, first of all, if uh, a ransom is paid, then it justifies uh, the crime on the part of the criminal. If they don't pay and data is, uh, the criminal then has to do something to ensure that they are actually that they do mean business and that means selling on the data or releasing it um, but in many cases data isn't very valuable whether or not they know that i had an appendix operation 40 years ago uh, or whether i am currently being treated for a severe case of alcoholism or drug addiction is no great benefit uh, to uh, to anybody if i don't mind that information going out so, yeah, I, it's actually something that, that's been an interesting conversation over the years. Um, when people say, oh, I don't mind if they take my data. Um, but one of the interesting things that I think this kind of gets more into the, the psychological side of it is, is building that profile on people. And we release so much information on the internet that we see as trivial. But if you actually take that bit of, you know, your liver problems with your alcoholism with these bits and you know then i know something about you um which is inherently you know uh, personal but i could use it for targeting trying to sell you a service yeah you know, uh, sell you more alka <laughs> yeah well, but, but it is and this is exactly what happened if um anyone's you know, followed the, the u.s elections a number of years ago this is the speculation it was i think it was um I remember how many thousand now, but the, the, the marketeers, the, the Cambridge Analyticas of the world, or whatever, they have thousands of these little data points, what they call about you, just little bits of information that, like that on their own, mean nothing, but pulled together can create a targeted profile and say, I'm going to start serving you this information or the service or what have you over time. Um, and, and slowly influence you in the way I want, that kind of thing. Yes. So this is the I, other side of the, of the warfare, cyber. Yeah. I heard one uh, case in the 2016 election where Cambridge Analytica would analyze a piece of information about somebody, for example, that they loved rabbits but hated mm -hmm. trains. And they put those together and got a newspaper headline of Hillary Clinton driving a train, killing a rabbit. And that was the sort of thing that turned people away from Hillary Clinton because they were able to show the two things about her that uh, would alienate a potential, a, a neutral voter. And they were able to find who was plausible or to whom such a, a, a revelation would be plausible and believable. Mm. You know, um, but an awful lot of work has to go into that type of detailed analysis that detail and therefore it has to be worthwhile therefore you wonder is it state sponsored individuals aren't going to profit by uh, an election going one way but governments might hence you must ask could such cyber crimes be state sponsored well there, 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 are, there are many levels of um, of the cyber criminal and the one that we always like to hear about as much as we don't like to hear about them is this idea of the state sponsored um, attack groups and some of these could be you know groups that are actually directly under you know ministries or employment of, of, of governments but uh, you know sometimes you see different threat acts or actors like there's a supply chain there as well so inadvertently I think one of the things about the wizard spider case is that you know there there are links to um, states uh, Russia being one and so on but it's been very difficult to even prove whether they're actually being instructed by mm. you know, um, particularly when you see you know the news headlines and so on of of these different apologies that go on and so on and what have you 
you'd wonder, is there a direct relationship between these, these state, these state sponsors groups and the states themselves? Um, uh, but, you know, yeah, yeah. So if uh, we here in, I mean, in many ways we have, for example, we have a small army because we're not likely to be invaded. At least that's what we always thought. This is different. We're just as vulnerable to attack as any large country uh, in this area. Hence, cybersecurity is just as important, is more important in many ways than military security. How do we as a country respond to this uh, nationally, as opposed to just each, do each organization looking after themselves? Uh, well, one of the things that I think that's, that's growing a little bit more in Ireland are just communities and groups. Uh, we, this form here to bring awareness to people. Um, one of the, I think one of the things that will come out of the HSC attack is a greater, um, a greater financial investment uh, in our national services, so like the NCSC and so on. Um, these are the, the central bodies that are part of the, the Department of Communications. And, and, and getting these bodies integrated more, um, bringing greater legislation, believe it or not, uh, I mean, one of the one of the most interesting changes in cybersecurity information security was the recent data protection changes that created a, ser a level of seriousness. And in you know operators essential services, there is the NIS directive as well, which came out at the same time. And these are prescriptions at an EU level to everybody to have a responsibility to have some sort of security in place and ensure that you're keeping people's data safe. Uh, that you're not sharing it with the wrong people for the wrong reasons. And then also those protections that we put in for protecting our, the data or, or, or our customers' information should, by proxy, protect it in some way from these other state actors or cyber gangs and so on, because we have increased our ability there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, an issue that uh, this issue has risen in the public consciousness in the last month. Um, is there a political will to spend money on uh, cybersecurity or, for example, in an organization, a state service like the ESB, is much of the uh, work expected to be done by the individual organization or should the state be offering, like, for example, we have an army, we don't have private armies, we have a state army. Should we have a statutory body that is in charge and ensures that individual organizations adhere to strict cybersecurity uh, controls? Well, I suppose you get, it's kind of getting quite draconian, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> you know? um, like if you come back to what I was saying earlier, I, I mentioned the, the whole idea of a risk appetite. Um, ah. So when, when it comes down to an organization level or individual level, it, it comes back to risk at a state level. I think they have to look at that at more of a state risk as such. Um, and it may very well find that if there are hundreds of thousands of organizations in Ireland connected to the internet that have no security, but are processing all these data, then you know, there, there would be some things that I imagine. Mm. Uh, you can see in the news in America, uh, um, President Biden has taken it extremely seriously. You look um, just a couple of weeks before the, the HSE attack, there was a major uh, gas pipeline that was uh, affected as well. Um, and before that, there were you know, various other attacks over the last year that has caused serious concern um, and is definitely changing the minds. Um, unfortunately, it had to come into, the, the, uh, into Ireland to make us do a little bit more as well in the news, but um, well, it's, it's definitely getting more serious. All right. But maybe that's the silver lining behind this attack, that now that we know that it can happen to us, Maybe we all will become more cybersecurity aware mm. and more careful. Uh, 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 the fact that we can access newspapers in America or in Canada uh, means somebody in another country can access us if we're not careful. Um, it's the, it, but going back to what you said, it's a case of risk appetite and mitigating that risk. Mm. Is there anything that can be done to make an organization 100% secure? I'd love to say yes, but no. 
no, it's 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 not possible. Um, the, the, there's always going to be unknowns. Um, I, I'm sure, like some of the news, you have a zero day, as uh, or a zero day vulnerability, and these are vulnerabilities that people don't know about, including the manufacturers. Um, and to to say that you can be 100% secure, you need to be aware of all your weaknesses, which. You know, if you can, very, very good luck to you. <laughs> but it, it is an interesting thing, though, um, I was thinking about this during the week as well, because I used to work an awful lot with Brendan, small, medium businesses, now working with larger enterprises and you know, back and forth. And... Is there a white knight, a white hat hacker, for example, uh, that should we be employing hackers to test the vulnerability of our systems? I think every business... Again, depending on the appetite and depending on the type of business, there should be some relationship with a IT provider that can advise on security. I used to do an awful lot of consultancy. And, you know, if you look at yourself and your, your business, you have a service and a product that you provide, that's what you do. Um, and then there are providers out there in cybersecurity and information security is what they do. And they do it very, very well. And having a relationship with someone like that that can understand your business and understand your risk appetites and provide something to bubble wrap and, and take care of everything that you find dear, then I would definitely advise. Um, there are things you, you, you can go and learn yourself. You can subscribe to services to mitigate your risk, um, like something simple like moving your email from a free public-based service to one that has antivirus or spam. I mean, that's a quick thing that someone could do themselves, but. If you're a large organization and you've hundreds of employees and you need to do the same, it's a little bit bigger. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, um, well, actually, I'll go back for a second because I actually remembered what I was talking about is the advantages of being a smaller business. Um, it doesn't discourage bigger businesses, but one of the things I've noticed that's inherently difficult in any environment is um, this idea of knowing what you have. So the, in, in cybersecurity, we, we, there's a number of frameworks, and one is the, um, the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. And that breaks into five different parts, I think it is. It's like identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And this is exactly what the HSC are going through now. They're, they're in the respond and recover side of this framework. But where we should start is the identification. And this is where you, you know what you have. You know what computers are on your network. You know what your staff are, what their training are what types of data for your data protection and so on. That gets exponentially bigger as you get larger because there's more variables. But in smaller businesses, I think it's a lot easier to understand. And once you have that picture, then you know how to do your protecting, your detecting, and your response and recovery plans. So that's definitely a, an advantage there for, for the smaller businesses, I think. Yeah. I suppose that's, that's reassuring for a lot of the people around uh, this screen uh, at the moment because many of us... Uh, we're engaged in small small business, and we like to think that we can fly under the radar of uh, of cyber criminals. Um, have have you ever uh, been yourself ever been the victim of, or has anyone ever attempted to make you a victim of a cybersecurity crime? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm aware of. Um, I've, 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 I've acted on behalf of customers of mine before, um, of where they were victims of, of you know, uh, different kinds of cyber crimes. Um, one of the common ones I used to see were uh, people would buy their own phone systems for their offices. So, it's, you know, you have your internal extensions and, and these, but for maintenance purposes, they leave it connected to the internet for the service provider to be able to come in and fix and so on. But what we noticed was that um, their telephone bills were going up and up and up and up, even though the calls weren't changing. Uh, and simple little scams like that, you, you find that there was some crowd in, around the world that was making connecting to the phone system and making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of euros of phone calls around the world, ringing in and hanging up, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's uh, something that you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't realize there was a vulnerability. But people have moved away from landlines to VOIP mm. and to mobile calls. Does that increase vulnerability? It, it doesn't increase vulnerability. I think that kind of the wrong.
one way to look at it, either, but it changes what we call your threat landscape. So your threat landscape is, is your environment and all the threats that can impact it or you know, could likely impact it. By moving from your, your landline to a VoIP system, you're just changing how everything works. You still have to think about it in almost the same way or just a little bit more, uh, particularly if a phone system is connected to the internet and you want people to be able to use their mobiles to use your phone system and so on. Because um, obviously you have to provide that connectivity. Uh, whereas with a landline, there's only one person that can use it at one time, theoretically, and very little can go wrong, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, well, when, when, <laughs> when you say very little can go wrong, there's still that bit of very little there. Um, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, I suppose what I'm hearing uh, more than anything is constant vigilance. Um, I'm going to open up the discussion. I see that one of my colleagues, uh, Joe Mulhall, uh, has, uh, wants to ask a question. Hello, Joe. Good. Hello. Hello, Ray. Thank you very much for the, um, for the very interesting uh, talk. I have a question. It's, it's, what influence or impact does the presence of large multinational um, data-based organizations like Google, Facebook, and, and uh, these new data sensors you hear about being refused planning permission and reapplying for planning permission, uh, do that, does that have any impact on the thinking of the government when it comes to cybersecurity, or are they forced? I'm sure, I'm, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Um, and it, it's something that I look at quite closely myself because I'm kind of interested from a, a political, mm -hmm. geopolitical kind of uh, aspect. And you know, you see the tensions around the world between different states, you know, the U.S. and Russia and Korea and so on. Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard to overlook the fact that one of Ireland's biggest sectors is run by international organizations so likes of apple google as you say um and even facebook you know uh, when, when you look back again at the the, the the elections a number of years ago um and the speculation that russia was meddling in it you know did they do that through ireland yeah you know? because one of the interesting things is the size of the russian embassy in dublin has grown exponentially with the number of u.s based <laughs> data multinationals that have set up over here or so i believe um so their, their embassy has never been as big so um, but it, it does open interesting questions because you know I, I know a lot of people that would use you know the likes of obviously a lot of people use microsoft 365 or they use you know google apps or even facebook itself for their, their little business tools and when you have when you look at wanting to integrate those into your own business so if you want to use office 365 um, you have to look at it with the larger threatscape as well. So I don't know if, if, if anybody had just moved to Microsoft Teams or, or Zoom last year when we all started working from home, but even without cybersecurity or, or, or nation state threat actors, it was a very risky move for people to do because the likes of Microsoft had troubles trying to serve everybody. Now you're using a platform that's you know, starting to get impacted. Uh, and you use this to communicate with your customers, you use this to, to store your documents, and you know, if something happens to that, uh, that impacts your business. Now, if you just change that a little bit, if, if there was something to, to, to cause some sort of rift or whatever, um, and my, you know, Microsoft Teams was a, a targeted application from a cyber perspective, you have the same problem. You know, you have that impact to your business. You can't get at your emails. You can't get at your documents. Those kind of things. So it's very, uh, very careful. You know when you're thinking about where or what services you want to use you know, for those things. Yeah. And factor them into your your mitigation plans and your backup plans. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. Does anybody else have any queries that they'd like to ask Ray uh, before we conclude? I, I have Ian. If I yes, could. Robert. Yeah, uh, Ray, thank you. Uh, my query is on personal emails and avoiding <clears throat> scams or phishing emails. When I open up my inbox, obviously you have down the left the, the titles of everything in the inbox. Mm -hmm. If I clicked on it to look at the substance of the email, but not open a link, mm -hmm. am I safe? Or just in clicking on the email, have I already made a boo-boo? Interesting, interesting question. Um... I, I, I think the, the best thing for me to say is once you've clicked on it, you've, you've almost made a boo-boo. You know? um, you've engaged for a start, but it's very, very difficult to, to not. Um, 
because you know an awful lot of the telltale signs are it would inside the email so you want to go and have a look and be sure uh, there are there are ways there are methods to look at the email before you open it but it's not very common in a lot of email programs to be able to do that um for personal email and this is i think this is one thing that, that a lot of people try to try to stray away from is is paying for an email service so a lot of a lot of free mail email services they don't come with great antivirus or anti-spam controls to, to keep these bad emails out so they, they filter in quite a bit with even a, a small cheap service that has a good you know antivirus filter and something could reduce your risk there an awful lot can you recommend one uh i'm not working for any of them um but i, I know that, like google have paid for services so does microsoft um and then you know there, there's lots of systems out there but a lot of the free ones they wouldn't have the the I wouldn't be confident, shall we say, in keeping the spam out as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Dermot Gaynor has a query. Hello, Dermot. Well, that covers most of my query, but I just thought I'd ask Ray as well. Whatever about antivirus on my laptop, what's the position with regard to the mobile phone? Is there inbuilt protection there, or am I... You know, I have my personal emails and business emails coming to my iPhone as well. Um, is there something special I need to do there to protect myself? Well, again, I, I'd like to look at the type of email service you're using. Is it, is it a Microsoft service or is it Gmail? Specific? Yeah, Gmail. Very good. OK. And um, when it gets down to the phone, you know, some, some people say, for example, an iPhone is quite secure because of the way it's built. But the more controls you put on top of that, the safer you're going to be. And that's where we talk about our risk then. So, you know, you could be relatively fine, but if you had a little bit of antivirus on top of that on your phone, if it was Android or any of those, then you're you're fine, plus a little bit more. Yeah. That probably doesn't answer your question too much. Ah, uh, well, it does. Thank you. Um, if you, I mean, if, if I you can employ a control, the more controls that you can put in, the safer you theoretically should be. You're reducing, you're mitigating your risk. Don't worry. Yeah. I know that most people uh, who do use Google uh, or Gmail um, only initiate the double, the two factor authentication after they've been hacked for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, but at least uh, that may, the two factor authentication does make it a little bit more secure uh, uh, from emails being hacked. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it, it's not going to stop you getting the odd, uh, bizarre, and certainly questionable email. Um, but is yeah, there? Yeah, it's a great point about the the two factor authentication. It, it it's it's one of those basic things that that every service provider, when I think when you started to log into them over the last year or two, they're they're saying set up your two factor authentication now. Um, high, highly advised. Highly advised. Yeah. Mm. Well, if there's nothing else that people take away from that, everybody has a mobile phone and uh, maybe uh, and I, I suspect that no matter what uh, they say, everybody uses Google at some stage in their mm -hmm. lives. They may want to keep out the big corporate world, uh, but Google is still uh, it's almost uh, ubiquitous uh, and therefore almost uh, impossible to totally secure yourself. But uh, at the same time, they have a reputation to protect and therefore they're likely to uh, uh, to make themselves as secure as possible um we have to think that companies like facebook are not well they're never going to be philanthropic but at least they have to appear to be secure don't they that's true and this is one of the things that um that came out of gdpr uh, everybody was going crazy um, asking is, you know, is Microsoft Cloud or Office 365 or all of these compliant? And, you know, whether they were or not at the time, they had to become compliant because they needed to be able to serve, give, provide those services. Um, otherwise, you know, they wouldn't be available in Ireland. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, we all complained about the, the nitty gritty of GDPR and how it was in many ways used as an excuse not to do something. But it did serve a useful purpose. And I think the same could be said of cybersecurity, that we weren't aware. Now we are. We have no excuse not to be constantly vigilant. 
And therefore, I think a conversation like we're having today is a valuable one because it alerts people to things that they may not have been fully aware of. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to ask Ray? In that case, Raymond, I'd like to say thank you for oh, your welcome. insight, for your uh, outlining your expertise and your experience and allowing us to benefit from that. I hope that you continue to be vigilant because we need to keep our electricity going indefinitely. <laughs> And uh, I wish you well in all that you do in the future. And thank you for making your time available to us. Thank you very much. OK, bye bye, everybody. And uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks time on the 14th of June. On the 21st of June, we'll be having our club assembly. And uh, we look forward to seeing you during what we hope will be a sunny June. Thank you again. Bye bye now. Look forward to seeing you in two weeks time. Bye bye now. Bye.